Be Wealthy and Smart, Episode 96. into a world of wealth and financial freedom without budgets, boredom, or bosses on Be Wealthy and Smart. And now, here's your host, Linda P. Jones. Welcome to Be Wealthy and Smart. I'm Linda P. Jones, America's Wealth Mentor, empowering women and men worldwide to financial freedom. On today's show, I'm happy to have Kirk DePlessis. Kirk is the owner of OptionAlpha.com, and he trains people how to trade using options. Kirk and I had a really interesting conversation. Uh, We talked about options, why trade them, why people think that they are so speculative and risky, and some strategies that really are conservative, what his overall investment strategy is, and why most money managers don't really discuss options or use them too much with their clients. At the end of the interview, I talked with Kurt about a specific instance where in his home state of Pennsylvania and near the Pittsburgh area in a small town, the taxes on real estate in his area were tremendously increased. I brought this conversation up with Kirk because we had it at a conference and I wanted to recreate that conversation and share it with you because of the trend that is happening in cycles of real estate taxation increasing. So to see this already happening in the Pittsburgh area and to hear the devastating effects of it, I wanted to share true stories with you, tell you about this 100-year-old farm and what happened to it, one of the largest farms in the area there, and what Kirk has to say about what he's experienced with real estate taxation. So it's a really interesting interview. I know you're going to enjoy it. Without further delay, here's Kirk. Kirk, how are you? Good. Thanks for having me on, Linda. I'm so excited to have you here. Your website is optionalpha.com. Yep. And you live in Pennsylvania. Tell us about how you got started with Option Alpha. Uh, so it's been a, about an eight-year journey right now, and um, so it was not an overnight thing by any means. Uh, but I used to be an investment banker in New York. That's where I, where I really got my start in, I guess, the finance industry. Um, so I worked uh, for Deutsche Bank in New York. I was in m and did that for a little while, kind of got a little bit burnt out on the hours, and started dating my now wife at the time, who said, you know, it's either New York or me. And so we decided to move to D.C. and, you know, kind of slow things down a little bit. I was still in the investing space. I was working as a retail analyst uh, covering REITs, so real estate investment trusts. And in my time in D.C., I actually started up the website and started posting some of my ideas and trades and strategies, you know, that I had kind of learned in my rotations in New York uh, on the trading desk and, and in the private side. Um, and so I just started doing that. And over time, it's slowly grown and grown. And it's a passion of mine to help other people learn more about, you know, how to take control of their financials uh, with options. And I think that it's a really uh, cool way to do things. And it's much, much safer than most people are led on to believe. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that, because the losses are limited. And people can really, you know, hedge and do a lot of things that there really isn't a lot of other ways to do it other than using options. So we're going to get into that. So tell us what options are and why should we trade them? Okay, so options in their most basic term are derivatives, meaning that they derive their value from something else. Now, in the case of almost all options that we would trade in the U.S. markets, options derive their value from the underlying stock, meaning that without the underlying stock, there would be no options market. But Options honestly give you options. I mean, no pun intended, but they give you the ability to build a strategy around a stock that's not one directional or one dimensional. And so as maybe a quick example of that, if you were to invest in any particular stock out there, most investors and traders only know one way of doing it, meaning that you either buy the stock and hope it goes up or you can short sell the stock and hope it goes down. So it's a one directional, one way street in which you can profit from that stock. With options, you have the ability to build a strategy around any particular outcome that you might desire. So 
For example, you could say, I want to build a strategy that profits if the stock stays between $45 and $50. So instead of trading it one directional, you now have the ability to say, hey, I don't care where the stock goes, but as long as it stays between $45 and $55, then I'll make some money on it. Or you can trade overall market volatility. I know that that's becoming one of the more popular ways to trade options is just to trade overall overall market volatility. So if generally stocks are more active and move more, you tend to make more money. If stocks are less active and don't move as much, you can even profit if the stock is just sitting there and not moving a lot. Yeah, and people are using options as an income strategy as well, right? Right, yeah, and I think that's, I mean, that's the way that, that I teach it and the way that I've always been taught is to use it not only as a hedge for your portfolio, but as a, a true income strategy. I mean, in the world of options trading, it's so much different than just a one-dimensional stock trade because you have the ability to calculate and figure out your exact probability of success for any option that you might trade. So when you look at an option chain, you basically have the option to pick you know, how often you want to win. You know, If you want to win 80% of the time, then you pick you know, those options. If you want to win 70% of the time and maybe make a little bit more money, but you're going to sacrifice a little bit of your win rate, then you can pick those options. And it really kind of leaves the door open to, you know, many different styles of trading and investing. Why do you think options have such a bad rap and people think they're so risky and speculative? Yeah, I think it's an easy one because if you really, if you think about it and you hear so much about options trading, it's always the options trades that go really, really bad. And those are usually the undefined risk type strategies. So selling a call naked or selling a put naked. And the reason that they go so bad and people tend to lose a lot of money on those is because they're highly leveraged. So unlike a stock investment that you have to put up all the capital for that stock when you initially purchase the stock, with an option contract, you're usually leveraging the shares of that particular underlying company, sometimes, you know, 100 to 1. So option contracts can cost very little amount of notional value or face value, but then they end up controlling a large amount of shares. But the reality is, is that if you learn to, to do them in a safe, you know, manner by doing risk defined spreads and trades, then they actually have dramatically less risk than, say, an individual stock position that's out there. Okay, so there's some lingo in there that we might want to cover. For people who aren't familiar with the term naked, you might want to explain what that means. Gotcha. So in the case of selling, let's say, a call option, if you do that naked, it means that you have no, no basis or you have no underlying asset to cover that position. And so basically what you're saying is, you know, if this stock goes higher, then I assume all of the risk, however high that stock goes. Now, options give you the opportunity to trade different contracts, meaning that you can define your risk on a trade. So the way that I like to trade often is I will sell a call option and then I'll buy a call option at a higher strike price. And by doing that, I know exactly what my risk is on the trade. I am not naked, I'm defined, meaning that at no point can I lose more than my initial investment in that trade or my initial margin requirement in that trade. So I think where a lot of people get you know, get hung up on options and, and really get um, or, or really see a lot of their, you know, early losses is that they do things undefined risk. They don't really know, you know, what the contracts are and, and how they derive their value. And they end up just making, unfortunately, silly decisions about, you know, how they trade. And when you talk about margin, you're talking about borrowing to invest. Do you use margin on your options trades? hundred percent. Yeah. Margin, I think, is a great thing. I mean, I think all leverage is good when it's used in moderation, right? I mean, if you use too much leverage and you over lever your account, then I think it can be really detrimental to you. Only when it, the markets are bad. And that's usually when things tend to go wrong for most people, right? Is they have too much margin and then the markets turn against them and, you know, they're stuck holding basically, you know, nothing in their account or have this big margin call. But um, I personally love to use margin in my account. I think that's a great asset for an options trader is the ability to trade on margin. But I do suggest on all cases, and this is something that I talk about a lot on my website, is that people never should trade more than 50% of their account in margin. And I'm probably one of the more conservative traders out there who will say that. I've seen a lot of guys who will trade 70% of their account, 80% of their account on margin. 
I'm at the level that I think 50% is the max because that leaves a lot of room for the market to maybe make a move against you and you still have capital to keep trading and investing. And by using margin, you're actually increasing your rate of return. Exactly. Yeah. And, and that's why, you know, I think that you can make an outsized return using margin, but you still want to do it in a smart way. So even investing 50% of your account on margin and leaving the other 50% to absolutely sit in cash and do nothing, you're going to make more money on that 50% than you would if you invested the entire 100% of your account in you know any particular stock that's out there. Mm -hmm. So what's your overall investing strategy? Okay, so this one is this one's going to get a little bit deep and complicated here, but the investing strategy that we have is on volatility. So the way that we trade is we are premium sellers, meaning that we are net sellers of options in nearly all cases. So if we do any type of trading, we always want to be selling options and taking in or receiving a credit. And that's where most people get that income stream from trading options. The reason that we're a volatility trader is because we know historically it's been proven many times and and Honestly, a lot of financial models build this into uh, how they derive stock prices and values in the future. But we know that volatility in the market is always overstated, meaning that when the market is moving, people always tend to expect the market to either move up more than it really does or tend to expect the market to move down more than it really does. And so as an options trader, we can take advantage of that mispricing by selling expensive options that really were not are not supposed to be that expensive when the market actually plays out. So if the market is supposed to move 10% in a given year, if the market actually starts moving, it might only move 8%. So most people expected the market to move 10% up or down. The market actually moved about 8% up or down. That 2% difference is a volatility premium that we can capture as a trader. And so it might be a little bit hard to understand and, and go through the lingo for sure. But the reality is, is that the markets always over expect in either direction. You know, people always think the markets are going to be too bullish or too bearish, and they ne never tend to be at that further extreme. And so we play those further extremes, and that's where we end up generating a lot of our money. That's really interesting. What do you think about markets since 2008? Have they really changed since, you know, the, the big, the Great Recession? Yeah, so I think the markets since 2008 have become incredibly more liquid. In fact, the options market is growing at such a fast pace, it, it's, almost, uh, it's almost exponential growth that we're seeing year over year in the options market. And that's honestly a good thing. I mean, the more liquidity that's in the market, the fairer the pricing becomes, and honestly, the easier that it is to get into and out of trades. Uh, as an options trader myself, I love the additional liquidity. I think that since 2008, a lot of people have you know, turn to options and, and other types of derivatives, whether that's futures or Forex, because they're starting to see that the markets are, are fair. Uh, and so I think that since the last, you know, kind of market crash, we've seen definitely an increase in people who, who want to trade options and want to take control of their future. And it's a good thing. It's overall a good thing for the market to have more participants, more educated participants in the market. So why do you think most money managers don't talk about options with their clients? <laughs> they don't know. Honestly, they don't know. I am, I mean, in all reality, I have spoken to, you know, people who have been members of my website that manage multi-million dollar portfolios and they've never you know, traded an option in their life. But they'll sometimes be the first person to quote unquote bash an options trade because they just don't understand it. They don't understand the mechanics of how it works. And the reality is, is I think that most money managers would love to trade options if they understood it. And so, and maybe we'll get to this now or later, but I've got a great example of how you can use a very simple strategy if you own a stock to increase your success rate and possibly increase your return on stock using options. And But again, most people don't do it or most money managers don't do it because they just don't understand it. It's easier for them to bash options trading and to say that buy and hold works long term. When the reality is, is that it may not work as well as an option trading strategy. Mm -hmm. How long do you think it takes to get good at trading options? Yeah, I mean, it's like anything in life, right? If it's worth doing, it's going to take a little while to get good at. I think that the, the best people I've seen come through our training and our program are people who understand that it's purely a numbers game. I mean, when you 
talk about long-term investing in a stock, that may be more of your, you know, analysis in the company, that fundamental kind of aspect, you know, how much cash is the company generating, you know, what kind of new markets are they in. But in the options trading world, it's 100% math-based. There's nothing else that we really care about. I don't care what Apple or Google are doing on a day-to-day basis because everything I do is probability and numbers-based. So if you have a good understanding of the numbers, I think the learning curve is is much, you know, uh, shorter. If you don't have good understanding of, you know, just probabilities and how numbers work, then obviously it's going to be a little bit longer learning curve. But at the end of the day, I mean, my thought on this is that if you can take control of your, you know, financial account and not are at the whims of the market going up and down, I mean, wouldn't that be better than anything else? You know, I was talking to somebody the other day and that in the last, you know, since the time that we're recording this show, the last market down move that we just saw was almost, you know, it was 10% plus, about nine and a half percent. During that down move, we made overall in our portfolio 6%. So that's a beat in the market of almost 15% while the market was moving down. Don't you think it's worth it? And I'm, not, I'm asking this rhetorically, but you know, I hope that people see that it's worth it to invest a little bit of their time just to even understand what this stuff is and how they might be able to use just even a small portion of it to help reduce their risk in their portfolio. And how do they learn to trade options? Is it through paper trading or a simulation machine, or how does that work? Okay, so you can learn to trade options through paper trading. I'm definitely an advocate of saying that you should at least start with the paper trading, but the problem that I see most often with paper trading is really two things. Is that, one, the paper trading system gives you as much money as you want, right? I mean, it's just paper. It's monopoly money. So most people who get started paper trading, they say, oh, well, what if I had you know $100,000 or $500,000 to trade? And the reality is that most traders that get started maybe have ten dollars or $15,000. So it kind of you know sets you up for failure because you think you're trading this big account. And number two is that most paper trading systems have automatic order fill, meaning that whatever price you're trying to fill a contract at, it will assume that that price gets filled automatically because it's just a paper trading system. It's not a real fill. And... I think that's a little bit of a misconception by most of the brokers that, you know, contracts are are as easily filled as they are with stock. I think stock is generally a little bit more liquid. An options trading order might take a little bit more time to get filled. You know, pricing might be a little bit different than what you can actually get. Uh, But I still think you should start paper trading and then as quickly as possible, move over to an options, you know, trading account that's live and real money. I mean, again, options trading you can do for less than $50 a trade and make it very, very small completely risk defined meaning you can't lose more than your initial investment so why not start to you know learn how to do it with just a small notional value in your account Mm -hmm. so how complex would you say it is to learn to trade options you know at the end of the day this business is incredibly simple it's incredibly simple but like anything else the moving parts within it are are obviously complex i always say i use the analogy that your car is very simple to operate right you use the steering wheel a couple little levers for turn signals the gas and the brake right incredibly easy to use on a day-to-day basis and get down the road get you from point a to point b it's the same thing with trading but then the intricacies within it are obviously a little bit more complicated so you know how does the engine work you know, how do the wheels turn and the axles and stuff like that. So it's obviously complex the more, you know, the deeper you dig into it. But on the outside, I think it's something that everybody can learn. It's not that it's, you know, definitely closed off for for the public. I mean, nowadays with the technology that's rolling out, with the education, you know, that's out there online, uh, I think people are very, very easily able to pick this thing up and run with it, you know, in a couple weeks to a couple months. Well, back in the day, in the late 90s, when I was doing some initial stock trading, I did trade some options and had some limited success and had some failures, probably had more failures than success. I really couldn't get the time premium situation down. Right. I'd run out of time. And um, even if I'd have a profit in them, it would seem like uh, the profit would slip away due to that. So I, I have some work to do to learn more about trading options for sure. Yeah. Yeah. But I think, um, you know, it sounds like a really great system for people to learn in terms of just having some diversity in their portfolio, having some different ways that they can generate income. Believe it or not, my 96-year-old mother had a boyfriend who (laughs) traded options, and he did a very conservative strategy where he created income for himself, and he did very, very well. And so... 
It doesn't have to be a high risk strategy, as you said. It doesn't have to be speculative. And there's all different kinds of ways to make it work and make money with options. So I right. think that's uh, really great well, that you're doing that. And we can even talk about maybe just one quick example that I kind of wrote down as, as just a basic uh, basic trade, if that works. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So so just last Friday, um, again, at the time that we're recording this, just last Friday, Walmart, which is a big stock, you know, a, a Dow stock, everyone wants to own Walmart. Well, maybe not now since they're lower, but you could make the case that if you wanted to own Walmart, now might be a good time to buy it since it's low, right? And so just last Friday, Walmart was trading for 59.25. And the yield on Walmart in their dividend that they were paying was a little over 3.5%. Now, most people who would go into a regular traditional trade in Walmart are just going to trade it one direction. I mean, if they buy stock at 59 and a quarter, then they only make money if the stock goes higher than that price, right? They, I mean, they can't make money if the stock goes lower. Right. right. So if you use a very simple option strategy, which is called a covered call, and so you take that same investment in Walmart stock and you sell a 62.5 call option above where Walmart is trading. So again, Walmart's trading at 59 and a quarter. You sell the 62.5 call option. Now, what this does in real world, world terms is that it says, okay, if you own that stock and if it goes from 59 and a quarter, up to and above 62 and a half, which is where your call strike is, then you participate in no gains above 62 and a half. But this is only for the next 30 days. Okay, so for the next 30 days, if Walmart goes from 59 and a quarter up to and above 62 and a half, you still make the money up to 62 and a half, but nothing beyond there. So now you have capture upside gain. But in exchange for doing this, because there has to be a give and a take, in exchange for capping your upside gain just for the next 30 days, we're not talking long term or for the entire life of owning the stock, you get to receive a 75 cent reduction in every share that you purchased in Walmart. So now you've taken your Walmart trade and instead of having to pay 59 and a quarter, you're paying 75 cents less, which is one and a quarter percent less on the stock today than if you bought it with just without the option strategy. So the point here is that if the stock goes up to 62 and a half, you tend to make, or you're gonna make about five and a half percent in 30 days. I mean, you annualize that out, that's a phenomenal return. And so the reality is, is that when you cap your upside potential and you reduce your cost basis on owning the shares, you increase your overall success rate. Because now the stock can actually go down 75 cents and you don't lose any money in the next 30, in the next 30 days. I mean, talk, talk about a winning strategy long term to do this every single 30 days to sell another call option and reduce your cost basis by 75 cents every 30 days. Now you're into a strategy that protects you from some of the downside potential in the stock, but keeps the upside there every 30 days. So it would be important to find a stock that's very liquid, that pays a nice dividend. That Well, in this case, simple. yeah. In this yeah. case, Walmart pays a dividend. But even right. if you didn't, even if you had like a Netflix or, you know, Chipotle, something that maybe didn't pay dividend at the time, you can still reduce your cost basis on owning those shares. I mean, it's better to buy shares 75 cents cheaper today than to buy shares at the market price, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you can do that, and so what? You give up a little bit of upside potential, you still keep 5.5% for the next 30 days. And at the end of that 30 days, the contract expires and you can do it again or not or whatever you want to do. But I think it's a good risk reward. And I think that that's how you, you know, really kind of tilt the odds in your favor and use options to, to help protect that downside. So have you been able to do that over and over and over and get your cost yeah. basis on a stock really low? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can actually get, I've seen guys that have gotten stock basis, the cost of owning the stock into negative territory. Um, so I own a lot of REIT stocks because that's that's what I know. So that's really the only stocks that I go long into. I know the business. I still know the CEOs that run the companies. And I've been able to cut one of the REIT stocks that, that I own almost by 30% of cost basis. And that's just by that consistently selling that call option. So now at this point, if the stock goes 30% lower, I, I don't lose any money. I don't make any money, but I have that buffer in there from doing this over and over and over again. Hmm. Interesting. Really interesting. How can people get started doing this? 
So well, you can go to optionalpha.com if you want to. I mean, that's all, honestly the first place that, that I would suggest people start. We've got a number one ranked and, and rated platform. We've got more than a thousand different video tutorials and case studies in there, but everything is in there in different sections and courses. So if you're a beginner or an intermediate or even an advanced trader, we've got everything laid out in there and it's completely free. There's no credit card, no trial. It doesn't at some point turn into a, you know, a paid thing. It's completely 100% free and open. I want to get as many people trading options as humanly possible because that increases the liquidity for everybody. It reduces commissions and slippage. And it generally just makes the market more efficient, which is, at the end of the day, better for all of us. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, I want to shift gears for a second and talk about a different kind of investment, okay? Yep, let's do it. Okay, let's talk about real estate, because you and I have had some conversations about real estate and what went on in the case of Pennsylvania, where you live, um, which was really interesting about taxes going up. And I just wanted to have you tell that story of what happened in your town. Yeah, so so we live in a small town outside of Pittsburgh. Um, it's actually a town that my wife kind of grew up in, but it's a university town. So there's a actually the second largest state school is in our town. Um, but recently in our town, they went around and redid the assessment on all the property values. Now, let me go back and say this: is that the last time that an assessment's been done was back in the '60s. So we're talking almost sixty, or I'm sorry, almost what is that, almost 50 years that they haven't done a tax assessment in this town. Now, taxes are are generally you know low in our town, but they just went around and reassessed all the properties up to current market value. Now, in doing this, some places and some, even I think my neighbor across the street, saw a huge increase in their taxes because of this new reassessment. And in our case, with me and my wife, our taxes went up by 33% almost exactly. Uh, my father-in-law and my brother-in-law, their taxes doubled and tripled. Some taxes almost quadrupled. And I think I sent you a link of that when we were just emailing back and forth that you can add maybe to the show notes. But in some cases, taxes are going up you know, three and four times what they were last year. And unfortunately, what we're seeing in our town now is that that quick jump in the real estate taxes has caused or is going to cause, in my opinion, I think a huge de decline in property values because it's just going to be harder for people to qualify, you know, across the board. And we started to see listings and um, places that are, are up for sale now just almost balloon overnight. I mean, you drive down one of our streets now and it's like every third house is up for sale. And that's just not, you know, it's not good economics, I don't think, you know, I, I especially know that everyone is obviously furious in town about what's going on. But at the end of the day, it's just going to cause a huge vacuum in the real estate market, which is going to trickle into other things. Wow. And you also mentioned a farm, a hundred year old farm, right? Yeah. Yeah. There's actually a couple farms now that have folded, but there's uh, a couple farms in our area. I mean, we're not a huge, uh, you know, technology hub or anything. I mean, it's a pretty, you know, blue collar, hardworking, you know, kind of area. And there was a, about a 120 acre farm that said, you know, we're just going to close up shop. I mean, their taxes, you know, almost tripled and they just cannot physically pay their workers anymore to, to do anything. They'd be running the farm at a huge loss. And we're talking just the farm itself, I think, employed more than, you know, 50 people. And then all the ancillary people that are around that, you know, starting to lose their jobs because of this farm. I mean, think of all the service people that just service this farm, not the actual employees that they have under them. Um, you know, it's just going to create a really bad situation in our town. Now, you know, in my case with me and my wife, I mean, I love our house. I, I think we got a great deal at the time on it. And we plan to stay here, you know, for the rest of our lives in this town and area because our family's here and this is where we want our daughter to grow up. But um, but it's definitely going to have a huge impact on, on the real estate market and the economy in this area for sure. And this trend I see is really starting, you know, all over. I mean, we're seeing Chicago, of course, Detroit, but all these different cities are talking about raising taxes quite a bit. So it was really fascinating to hear your story up close and personal, you know, from your perspective and what really happens when taxes are raised so dramatically. And if that's yeah. a trend, then... Wow, what does that say about real estate in the country? And since you've been following real estate, maybe you can give us your opinion about that. You know, I think that at the end of the day, I mean, if you're an investor in real estate, and my wife and I are, I mean, we own seven different properties with 10 units all together. So, so we're definitely heavily involved in real estate, not only in this area, but also in Virginia and West Virginia, we've got property. 
Um, I think that the reality is is that you have to be able to build a cushion in because no matter what happens, a bunch of things can go up in in va- you know in costs. Whether you're paying utilities or whether that's real estate taxes or insurance, mortgage insurance if you have that on any of your properties, homeowner dues and condo dues. So I think the reality is is that you have to build in a huge buffer on deals that you're looking at. I'm a big proponent of looking at a hundred deals and maybe buying two. You know what I mean? Buying the really two great deals instead of trying to buy everything that's out there. Um, so I, I think that taxes are going to go up. I mean, unfortunately, I think they, they always you know are going to maybe go up. And I think that if you err on the side of caution that they're going to go higher, they probably won't go higher in your area you know as much as they did here. I think that was maybe an anomaly. But but if you err on the side of, of caution that they're going to go up and, and build that into kind of how you analyze and look at a deal, uh, I think you'll be okay at the end of the day. How do you think rising interest rates, or do you think rates are going to rise soon, and how do you think that will impact the real estate market? Yeah, so full disclosure, I'm incredibly short the bond market with options, um, and have been, and I will continue to be. So even if the bond market stays here, rallies higher, I'll continue to get short the bond market more and more, because the interest rates have to rise. And it's never uh, it's never been a matter of if, it's just when, and how fast, and you know what type of velocity is that going to have. Now, obviously... The higher that interest rates go and the higher taxes go, the lower purchasing power goes for real estate. So at the end of the day, I think real estate in most areas might be you know, overinflated. I don't know if it's back to the levels that it was in 2004, 2005, but interest rates are incredibly low and taxes generally are low across the country. And if those two things start to go up, you'll start to see purchasing power start to go down dramatically, which means prices have to adjust lower. Yeah, it is definitely something that we're watching, and I totally agree with you on the bond market. In fact, we're looking for bond yields to go negative even. Yeah, I, I think they could. I mean, look, it's, it's happened before. I mean, it happened in Japan. Um, it happened recently. I, I don't know where it was, but it happened recently in the last two years. You know that, And that's kind of scary. I mean, honestly, if you think about it, for bond yields to go negative, people are willingly taking less money out of their investment, You know, taking the money to the bank and said, please, if you just give me a little bit less back in 30 days, you can have my money. I mean, people are, if that's the type of you know, scarcity that's out there right now, that's never a good thing. So, so I think they could go negative um, or get very, very close to going negative. If they do, then I would be incredibly short bonds at that point. Yeah, exactly. And especially the junk bond market is yeah. maybe a little scary too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Kirk, this has been so great. I really appreciate you being here and talking with us. I recommend optionalpha.com for anyone who wants to learn about option trading and learn all of your strategies. I think that's a really smart thing to do, especially in this environment and with the volatility we're likely to have and even more in the future. So, Absolutely. Well, thank you for having me on. I appreciate it, Linda. My pleasure. Thank you for listening to Be Wealthy and Smart with Linda P. Jones. Share the wealth and tell your family and friends about the show. Check out our website, blog, and social media for more riches at www.bewealthyandsmart.com.